It's such a pleasure to be here today and to be with you. Um, and following Steve Lloyd uh, is such a challenge, I gotta tell you. Um, one thing that he didn't mention was at the bottom of his slides, there's a, there's a logo that says 70 times seven, and that is from a, um, from a quote um, in a book called Dope Sick that Beth Macy, um, an author uh, from Roanoke, Virginia, that, that Beth wrote, and the book um, basically chronicles the story of uh, the opioid uh, addiction and overdose uh, crisis up through, I guess, the 81 corridor, if you will. And uh, the last chapter to um, uh, has some content in it about uh, Steve and uh, our working group and and some of our efforts, and including the story of uh, trying to open the clinic over Mountain Recovery, in which we were successful finally. But 70 times seven is, is, <laughs> is a quote uh, that's particularly impactful, and, the, and I'm gonna ruin the end of, ending of the book for you right here, but um, it has to do with when we were trying to open the clinic, and, and folks were, were um, Given Steve a hard time uh, publicly about you know kind of bringing in this methadone clinic and and um, you know medication assisted treatment and blah 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 and there's a, a fair amount of stigma being represented there and and so they asked the question well what are we supposed to do with these 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 addicts if you will which is a pejorative term and we're trying to move away from it in the field but um, <laughs> so how many times do we forgive them. How many, times do we, how many times do we let them back into our homes? And, and Steve uh, had grown up with some of these people and, and uh, he'd gone to church with them and, and knew them and he could see a steeple right over their heads and he said, we should, we should forgive them 70 times seven times. And, and that is... Uh, uh, a reference to a biblical story with how many times we're supposed to forgive each other. Um, so anyway, Steve, uh, thank you for what you do, and it's so impressive. But I'm here today uh, to first um, uh, kick off this panel, and we're going to uh, I'll, I'll briefly introduce folks in the interest of time, all right? And I'll briefly introduce folks, and then uh, they'll each take about 10 minutes, and, uh, and some of them will have slides. Uh, our first uh, panelist is Keith Gaither. He's Director of Managed Care Operations for Ten Care. Uh, Mr. Gaither is uh, basically responsible for 12, well, actually he's not responsible for the whole thing, but uh, Ten Care is a $12 billion Medicaid managed care program. Um, uh, Ten Care provides coordinated physical, behavioral, and long-term coverage to 1.4 million Tennesseans. And he's responsible for managing their relation, Ten Care's relationships with its three managed care organizations, which are Blue Care, America Group, and United Healthcare. And uh, he will talk about Ten Care's efforts to address the opioid um, crisis. Uh, Dr. Lisa Piercy uh, is in the middle, and is, by, by the way, is an ETSU uh, alum, and, was, uh, and she's uh, she's the fourteenth commissioner for the Tennessee Department of Health. Um, Preceding her public service, she spent a decade in health systems operation, uh, most recently as executive vice president of the West Tennessee uh, Healthcare, a public non not for profit health system with 7,000 employees serving in 22 counties. And uh, then we have Mr. Matt Yancey. Uh, hey. And Mr. Yancey serves as deputy commissioner for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse Services and is a, um, a key partner for communities and how they roll out different behavioral health services. Um, he, his um, office provides oversight for over 750 contracts with vendors uh, to provide community-based programs and um, has an annual budget of about 200 million and a team of over 100 people working in his, his office. Um, so I'm delighted to, to uh, moderate this panel and I'm gonna, I'm gonna I guess, what, what are we gonna go in? Are you gonna go, you're gonna go first? All right, great, excellent. And then we will, uh, I guess, have time for questions at the end. So prepare your questions, thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I first wanna say thanks to President Boyd 
and the University of Tennessee and the SOAR Planning Committee for putting this day together. It's been great so far. This is a beautiful facility. Um, I'm really excited to be here. I'm excited to be here with our partners from TenCare and the Department of Health. Um, I do serve and have the pleasure to serve as the Deputy Commissioner for the Tennessee Department of Mental Health. But I will tell you, um, at my core, I'm a social worker. I'm a trained social worker. I graduated from college on a Saturday. Uh, two days later, I entered the world of child welfare. Um, I did that work for about five years where I was the, the first knock on the door, uh, working with, with families where abuse and neglect had been substantiated. Um, I then worked as a school social worker uh, with several Title I schools in Cobb County. Um, I worked with uh, principals and administrators to partner with community mental health centers, with juvenile courts, with law enforcement to integrate those services into schools to ensure that learning environments were healthy and safe. Um, here recently, I've, I've worked more, mainly on the state level, uh, helping develop programs and, and help support communities across the state. I did move to Tennessee uh, four years ago, um, and I was telling a group of mayors just yesterday in Sparta that even though I moved to Tennessee four years ago, I didn't officially become a Tennessean until two years ago. And I bring this story up because I think it's pertinent to where we are. Um, two years ago, I, I met an individual here on this campus, and I had to write his name down, uh, Phil Fulmer. Are, are you familiar, Dr. Lloyd? You may, yeah. So I met Coach Fulmer, and uh, I introduced myself, and I said, you know, Coach, I'm Matt Yancey. And he said, nice to meet you. He said, where are you from? And I said, well, I'm from Macon, Georgia. And he, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> and he looked at me and said, well, did you go to the University of Georgia? And I thought, is that a trick question? I, I don't know how to answer that. But I did. And then he looked at me and said, well, I was 11 and 6 against the University of Georgia. And I said, yes, sir. And that was the day I became a Tennessean. Um, so anyway, I am going to uh, Tommy Farmer these slides. I don't know if Tommy's here. He went through all those slides so fast. I'm going to do the same thing. Um, real quick, our vision and mission is to be the be uh, most innovative, proactive state behavioral health authority in the country. Um, our commissioner is out of town today. I know she wishes she could be here. She is the biggest advocate in this state for people living with mental illness and substance use issues, and she certainly sends her regards. Just a few quick things about us as a department. We do not provide direct service. We operate four regional mental health institutes across the state where we have employees providing services, but with the exception of those hospitals, we do everything through a provider network. And I often say, and my team hears me say this quite often, we don't accomplish our mission and our vision without our treatment providers, our prevention coalitions, our advocates, our nonprofit organizations, our city, county governments, our courts. We do nothing without them. I wanted to spend just a few minutes talking about our current efforts. And man, I could take up the rest of the day talking about the great work we're doing uh, at the state, at the department, and through our provider network, but unfortunately, we don't have that time. Um, as you can see the, here on the screen, we support a continuum of care, and that starts with prevention work, treatment work, recovery support, and criminal justice. One program I did want to highlight as it relates to our prevention work as a department is the, the regional overdose prevention specialist. These individuals, and there's 20 across the state, and they're housed with our, I think it's 46 prevention coalitions. And I will tell you, uh, the prevention coalitions are the backbone of our prevention work across the state. Our regional overdose prevention specialists, as you can see from the screen here, are across the state. There's 20 of them. Um, I think Mr. Eric Landry, I don't know if Eric's here today. He is the regional uh, the overdose prevention specialist here in Knox. They've got three key goals. Uh, first is harm reduction. That is distributing naloxone. Um, we've heard a lot about naloxone um, earlier today. I look at this, this statistic and I'm amazed by it every time I see it. Um, we have distributed through the ropes and through our coalitions 50,000 units of naloxone. And the most amazing thing about that, and this is, I think is a conservative estimate, there's been 5,000 lives saved, 5,000. It's the ropes, it's the coalitions who are leading that charge. Our coalitions, our ropes, we're also doing training. We have trained over 20,000 lay people, over 6,000 law enforcement. 
It's interesting to think back in 2012, there was 36 drug take back boxes in Tennessee, 36. Today, we have over 330. So for the folks here, and I know Karen's here from the Metro Drug Coalitions, we really, truly appreciate the work that you do. It's critically important. We've also, as a department, have done a media campaign. You may have seen uh, the commercials and advertisements here in, in the Knox area. Um, it has been said at least five dozen times today, stigma is a barrier. I, if we're talking about access to care, access to high quality care, if there's one barrier, it is stigma. And I know the Department of Health is also doing some great work around generating awareness. Uh, we have done that over the past couple of years uh, through the TN Together program that was an in initiative started by Governor Haslam. And I don't even need to re read these main messages. These are messages that Monty has underscored, that Dr. Lloyd has underscored, that everybody on these panels has underscored. Addiction is not a disease, or addiction is a disease, it's not a moral failure. It's a brain disease, it's not a choice. It affects every community, it affects everybody. The more important thing is that resources are available, and that's what our campaign has done um, through TN Together, is really connect people who need treatment to treatment. This is the reach of our campaign. Uh, we have a pretty amazing communications director. He would be here if not for having his second child, Matthew Perriott, but 76 million touches, 76 million impressions with our campaign. We've got to continue to advance conversations around addiction. This is the call to action of our campaign, the Tennessee Red Line. If there's one thing that you write down on the back of your booklets as far as a note, write down this number. 1-800-889-9789. This red line is operated by our partners at TADIS. If you know someone who needs treatment resources, you can call this line 24 hours a day. And we have recently embedded a warm handoff component to the red line. We're connecting people to treatment as soon as they call. And this is a big deal because I'll tell you, people who are suffering with OUD and addiction, to pick up that phone and to say, I need help, that is a huge first step. And we are so thankful to have this program in place to respond to those callers. Medication-assisted treatment, moving into that treatment continuum. Um, I just want to spend a few minutes on MAT. You know, everyone's path to recovery is different. Every single person. Some people may need an absence-based approach. Some people may need medication-assisted treatment. The research on MAT, though, is pretty clear. It increases patient survival. It increases retention and treatment. It increases the ability to gain and maintain employment. And it also improves birth outcomes for women living with SUD, pregnant women. I did want to give a quick plug. You can see here on the screen. We as a department, one of our key goals is to educate our provider network around new treatment modalities. We are doing a second medication-assisted treatment symposium, a training institute on September 6th. We're doing it in partnership with TenCare and TADIS. I would really encourage you, if you're a clinician, if you're someone working in an in a OBOT, a treatment center, or if you're just someone in recovery, please check this out. Um, as stated previously, uh, there's more to medication than MAT. Counseling is a critical component. We have to go beyond the medication, and MAT is truly just a tool in the, in the toolbox. Here in Knoxville, um, we have recently, through federal funding, uh, started a hub and spoke program through the Helen Ross McNabb Center. Um, I think I saw some Helen Ross McNabb folks here earlier. If you're interested in learning more about what we're doing with McNabb through our hub and spoke, I would encourage you to speak to them. The Tennessee Recovery Navigators. Again, this is a, a new program that we started uh, through TN Together. At the end of the day, a lot of people who need help they go to the emergency room. People who overdose go to the emergency room. And we know when we get there, they're, they're, they're served and, and helped by doctors, by nurses, sometimes counselors. But what we realize is that many of those people in the worst day of their life, they need to talk to someone who's been right where they were or where they are. Uh, so through the recovery navigators, and we have 20 across the state, they're meeting people in the emergency rooms who've presented with overdose. And more importantly, they're connecting people to treatment. This is a huge thing for our state, and we are excited to do more with the Recovery Navigators moving forward. 
We have served 700 people just in the past year and a half or so in hospitals in Tennessee. And we're targeting those hospitals that have the highest percentage of overdoses. We're working closely with the Tennessee Hospital Association. This is the right work. Monty did a great job talking about our faith-based initiatives. Um, you can have the best treatment in the world, but until you provide housing, until you provide employment support, until you provide a sense of purpose, a connection, you're not gonna be successful. And that's where I'm really proud that around what we're doing in Tennessee on the faith-based initiative. We have 481 places of faith who've said we wanna play a role in recovery. 481, and Monty has helped lead that charge. I know Sarah is somewhere in the room. We have many Monty's, as we call them, across the state, working with faith communities every day to advance this work. We also have Lifeliners, and Lifeliners have been in place for four or five years. I know Jason Goodman, Jason Abernathy, I think are in the back. These, are, again, are individuals with lived experience who are increasing awareness, increasing knowledge around opioid use disorder. They're starting recovery meetings. They're connecting people to treatment. 8,700 people have been connected to treatment through these resources, through these boots on the ground. I tell you, future forward, and I know I'm running short on time. I, like I said, I moved to Tennessee four years ago, um, and I was amazed by the momentum happening in Tennessee through Governor Haslam and the legislature on addressing behavioral health issues. That momentum is continuing. Um, Governor Lee and his FY20 budget has added, I think, $25 million to our department's budget to address behavioral health issues in the state. And we are so appreciative of him and the General Assembly. I know Senator Massey's over there on the right. Investments are continuing to be made. Just a few that I'll highlight. Um, the first goal of any treatment plan is housing. You've got to have a safe, supportive place to live. Um, this program, the Creating Homes Initiative, was started 20 years ago by Commissioner Williams um, to serve people living with serious mental illness and co-occurring disorder and to help stand up housing for them to live in, all the way from supportive housing to independent housing to home ownership. Uh, with new investments this fiscal year, we're expanding that proven model to serve folks with SUD to create more recovery housing. Our goal this first year is to create 200 new housing options in Tennessee. This investment made by the governor has already paid off. I think it was two weeks ago, THDA has matched, has matched this, this amount dollar by dollar. So we've got $6 million out the gate to work with communities that you're from to stand up recovery housing here in Tennessee. Recovery courts, and w Tennessee's leading the nation in recovery court and the accountability court model. We have $1.7 million in FY20 to expand the recovery, work, recovery court work across the state. We expect to serve 500 more people. People, when you, when you connect accountability with treatment, it's a recipe for success. I'm really excited about this work. We're also standing up a women's residential recovery court. Um, up the street in Morgan County, many of you may know, there is a recovery, residential recovery court for men. It has been successful. We're doing the same with women. Um, we're looking to stand this up, I believe, in Davison County. Um, we are really excited about this. And y'all may see a, a theme here. Criminal justice liaisons. Um, when you think about opportunities to serve, to serve people, to better serve people, you have to think about transitions whether they're transitioning out of acute care back into the community, whether they're transitioning from incarceration back into the community, that is the biggest opportunity to connect and serve, with, serve people. This is what the Criminal Justice Liaison Program does. It connects people to treatment, to housing, to employment services for folks who are reintegrating from local jails. We are expanding this work. Pre-arrest diversion infrastructure. I heard Commissioner Parker yesterday talk about uh, the work that TDOC is doing on reintegration. I think it's great. I also think one way to, to reform our criminal justice system is to keep people from being arrested to begin with. And what we started about three years ago through this initiative, um, we created seven programs across the state, one here in Knoxville, um, to give law enforcement a place for people to be dropped off 
who are having a behavioral health need and are interfacing with the criminal justice system. We're doing more of that this year. We have 1.5 million to create, hopefully, two more centers across the state to keep people out of jail and to get them into treatment. I did not mean to skip 10 rocks, Judge Sloan, but it's on here. I know you'll speak to that later. <laughs> Look, we know with the recovery courts, they, they can't serve everybody, but with 10 rocks, disappeared on me. Um, we're addressing that gap population. And through the hard work of Judge Sloan and the advocacy he's had across the state, we're expanding the 10 Rocks courts. They currently are in 10 counties. Um, we're hoping to serve an additional uh, 10 counties and ho hopefully 450 more people with that 10 Rocks docket. And last but not least, um, I'm really excited about this. Someone referenced earlier law enforcement and transportation and people presenting in the emergency rooms. We're hiring a psychiatrist to work with our department, to work with EDs across the state, to train them on protocols. Protocols related to psychiatric emergencies, protocols related to addiction. We're trying to, again, meet people where they are. Uh, we developed protocols for psychiatric emergencies about two years ago with THA. Now we're hiring someone from the department to work with emergency rooms on implementing those protocols. Last but not least, um, Barriers and opportunities. We were asked to talk, to talk about barriers. I prefer to talk about opportunities. There's an increased need for prevention. Dr. Lloyd talked about adverse childhood experiences, talked about trauma. I think about my, my years working in the social services arena. I can tell you, every family that I've worked with, every child, every student, they've got a history of trauma in their life. And, and I love Dr. Lloyd's picture of the brain but I was thinking when he was talking about the brain, age three, age three is midlife for the brain. So the more we can do to engage families, parents, and children at a young, young age, the better success we'll have. We have to continue to focus on prevention, sustainability of new resources. A lot of the treatment work that we're doing, I talked about MAT, is being funded by the federal government. And I know one of our SAMHSA partners will be here later today. I think we've received $75 million in new federal funding through SAMHSA in the past three years, 75 million. We are concerned how to sustain that work moving forward. And we don't know yet uh, how the federal government's gonna respond, but that is, that is a potential barrier. Closing the gap, I did not mention that if we talk about our department and our, our core customer as far as treatment, it are, it's people who are uninsured or indigent. And we know with the resources that we have, I think we serve about 19,000 people a year in treatment. There's still more people that need treatment. So we've gotta close that gap. And, and I think we've gotta think beyond opioids. I'll leave you with this. I was at a budget hearing this session and a legislator was looking at all this data related to opioids. And he asked us a question, he said, do we have an opioid crisis or do we have an addiction crisis? I think he's right. I would, go on, I would go so far to say, we don't have an addiction crisis, we have a behavioral health crisis. We have three or four people a day in Tennessee losing their life to opioid use disorder. You have two additional people a day losing their lives to other drugs. You've got three people a day in Tennessee losing their lives to suicide. That's eight people. So we still have a lot of opportunity to connect people to the right resources, to connect them to recovery supports, I feel good because we got the right people on the ground level to do the work. Thank you. Hello, uh, thank you President Boyd for having us and for uh, having this excellent summit. I've got a couple of housekeeping items to start with. Uh, first, I wanna offer a friendly amendment to my um, colleague, Matt Yancey. Uh, in stating that there are multiple Monty Burks. There are not. There is one and only Dr. Monty Burks, uh, and uh, I use that opportunity to applaud the department uh, in recognition of um, the role of faith base. Uh, in just a moment, when I talk about uh, our media campaign, uh, I'll tell you about uh, how that surfaced there. Uh, the other point of housekeeping I wanna make is, I went to medical school with Dr. Lloyd in the mid to late 90s. 
And if you think he talks fast and is hyper now, he was just like that 20 plus years ago. And I am so glad you're back to yourself. And uh, I knew him then and I know him now. I didn't know in the middle, uh, but I respect and admire his story. Um, so when I came to the department uh, six months ago, Monday, um, I didn't really realize how much the Department of Health was doing in the opioid and substance misuse space. Like most, because it's in their name, I thought it was in the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse. But as a primary care uh, physician myself, I know that you absolutely cannot uh, distinguish between physical health and emotional or behavioral health, right? It's all one feeds the other. Uh, and so I was really proud to learn about the efforts of the Department of Health. Um, and the reason I don't have slides is because I can't say my name in 10 minutes, much less go through all of these slides. So uh, it'll keep us on track a little bit more if, if, uh, if I just uh, tell you about these. So I wanna tell you a few things about what the Department of Health is doing. And one of them is, it's already been mentioned today, is safer prescribing practices. Now, I'm not sure it's exactly 162 single space pages, if it is, uh, we need to look at that. But it has made significant strides in the state of Tennessee for safer prescribing. Uh, but that's just one component. It's one of those things that we can do to decrease the amount of exposure to opioids uh, for people, especially those who are opioid naive and need that third pay line. They just need that third uh, exposure, that third seven in, in the uh, jackpot. Um, to, to be addicted. And so safer prescribing practices has been one of the things that the Department of Health has been very uh, involved in. Now, I, I'm, a, I'm a realist and I will tell you, they are complicated and they are um, verbose and, and we're working to make those a little simpler. And there are unintended consequences as well. Uh, and, and in a room full of folks with, um, who are in the industry and are familiar, I mean, we need to talk openly and honestly about this. One of them, and, and it's, it's you know something that's already been mentioned, is the drive to illicit substances, and you'll hear me talk about that in just a second. The other thing that's been an unintended consequence, and some of you may have experienced this in your own communities, is that doctors are just scared to prescribe now. And so patients who have legitimate need are having more difficulty accessing care and accessing appropriate care because people are afraid. Um, and so it's one of those things, when the pendulum swings, we have to make sure it doesn't swing too far, uh, we have to bring it back in. Part and parcel of all of that is uh, expanding our resources for treatment and recovery, uh, primarily through the uh, resources uh, that uh, Deputy Commissioner Yancey just spoke about, uh, but also um, uh, increasing access to harm reduction strategies. Now, some of you know my story and that I'm not a traditional public health professional. Uh, I came from the health care space. And some other time, we'll do a whole hour long talk about the differences in health and health care. It's a lot more than you might think. Um, but the whole key focus of public health is prevention and harm reduction. Uh, and so one of those harm reduction strategies that you're very familiar with is naloxone, but it's also things like syringe swap programs, which I understand has some political connotation uh, and, and we have to overcome that. But we're also seeing a rise in a lot of injectable uh, related or injection related diseases hepatitis C. We also see hepatitis A increase among drug use population. That's not necessarily an injection-based um, or injection-rooted disease, but we're seeing a lot of diseases related uh, to opioid misuse. And so there are broader health implications than just the addiction itself. Um, other things that we've done uh, in the department, uh, providing community support, and one is uh, decreasing the number of babies born with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Uh, primarily, that is through uh, prevention of unintended pregnancies. When you, talk, when you talk to moms who have babies with NAS, I'm not going to be able to quote the exact number because I'm not really sure how great the data is, but it's an astounding majority of the number of moms that have babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. Those were unintended pregnancies. So what's one way to reduce or prevent NAS? It's to reduce unintended pregnancies and help women uh, with proper birth uh, planning uh, and birth spacing. Uh, these are, uh, you know, just a, a handful of the um, issues or, or of the initiatives that we've done. 
a, lot, a big portion of what we do is data collection and surveillance, uh, and, and that we're not the only ones who do that, uh, but that is a big part of what we do. I've got an entire tower of really smart epidemiologists uh, that I don't even speak their same language, uh, but they do a really good job uh, on making sure we give accurate and helpful data. And then uh, another prominent thing that we've done is increasing awareness, and I made a reference to this a few minutes ago, and Deputy Commissioner Yancey did as well. Just two weeks ago, um, we launched the Faces of Opioids, Tennessee Faces of Opioids campaign. And that was something where we are highlighting one, at least one person in each of the 95 counties to tell their own opioid story. Naturally, we've got a lot of people who have struggled with addiction themselves, who have lost a family member. We've got a face in the audience, uh, more than one actually, because I'm one and I see a couple out here. Um, I represented my home county of Gibson County uh, in talking about babies with neonatal abstinence syndrome. I'm a child abuse pediatrician. I do still practice on a very small scale, um, and uh, I, it's affected me. Uh, and we'll talk more about that in just a second about how it's shaping uh, what we're doing at the department. You know, uh, we were asked to talk about barriers a little bit, and I'm not sure it's so much barriers that, that I wanted to tell you about so much as it is the things that scare me, the things, the challenges that, that we know that um, we're already starting to face. One of those, and it's not necessarily a new one, but we know more than we used to, that most overdoses uh, are related to poly substance abuse. There are more than one substance, uh, more than one substance on board. Uh, oftentimes that's benzodiazepines. Uh, for those of you in the audience may not know, that's the Xanax, Valium, Ativan um, type medications. And uh, when you talk about the potentiating effect or the additive effect, if you will, um, that becomes really scary. There's starting to be some conversations. They're right now just what I call hallway conversations, not anything formal, but um, the appetite is there for, do we need to look at benzodiazepine prescribing guidelines? Are we okay on that? I don't know, Dr. Lloyd has got an evil smile on his face because he knows we're going to write another 162 pages about that. No, just kidding. Um, but in, in all seriousness, um, the one of the challenges is how we address the poly substance use. Another one of those things that's already been referenced multiple times is the drive to illicit drugs. And you know what we've seen that's an interesting phenomenon, at least it's interesting to me? Most of you are very familiar with the prescription opioid issue being a rural issue, right? We talk a lot about Appalachian. We talk a lot about East Tennessee. When we see illicit overdoses, these are mostly in our metropolitan and urban areas. Um, naturally, that's uh, where, the, where the supply is higher and the access is a, is a bit easier just from the population standpoint. Um, but that's another thing, you know, we're starting to get a fairly decent handle on how to um, uh, address issues in rural areas, but in urban, that's a bit of a different beast. Um, we're seeing increase in youth use, so using younger, uh, and then something that we're all nervous about and watching is the increase of stimulant abuse. I know we're talking about opioids today, but we're really talking about addiction. Uh, and substance misuse today. Uh, and so, although it's opioids today, um, when you look at the curves of the overdoses, uh, you will see exponential, maybe on the order of 800% increase in um, uh, stimulant overdose deaths, cocaine and methamphetamine specifically. Uh, so those are the things that frighten me. But what's next? Um, what's next for the Department of Health? Well, obviously we're gonna keep doing uh, what we're doing and, and ramp that uh, effort up. Um, uh, we will continue the Faces of Opioids campaign that'll be going on through September. Uh, one thing that I referenced earlier that I didn't circle back to is how incredibly important faith was in all of those stories. Uh, almost all of them had some type of faith component. And I mean, these were completely unsolicited. We didn't give any guiding questions. We just had people just tell us your story and we were astounded. We knew that there was a strong link, but we didn't know there was almost a universal link there. Uh, and so that highlighted our need uh, to focus on those areas. Um, other things that, that we're pursuing, uh, as I mentioned, um, we're looking at benzodiazepines, we're looking at stimulants, uh, we're looking to uh, how we can individualize community support and response. One of the things that we're doing um, is something called county health assessments. Many of you may be familiar with a county health council. 
Uh, and the joke we oftentimes use is if you've seen one county health council, you've seen one county health council. They're widely varying. Um, some really small counties have large ones and some, and, and vice versa. Uh, some are very engaged, some are not. Uh, you can tell, you know, some just come for the lunch and I'm, I'm not, uh, you know, I, that's just how it goes. People are busy, I understand. Uh, but as a department, we are uh, actively trying to leverage those local community resources and help them go through a structured process of assessing the health needs in their counties. So we've just finished the first pilot of 16 counties and over the next three years, we will complete all 95 counties in Tennessee. And in those first 16, again, we have heard this resounding theme come out. And we let me, let me tell you a little bit how it works. We didn't really say, here's a menu of problems you can choose from, but we do offer our, what we call vital signs dashboard, which is 12 vital signs of health. And it's everything from teen pregnancy and smoking to access to parks and greenways, third grade reading level, all of the factors that influence health. Um, almost every single one of the 16 that we've done, I believe 15 of them have identified behavioral health as the first or second um, priority for their county. And so um, learning how and, and figuring out how to address that on individual community and county needs or, or at their level uh, is, is something definitely on our horizon. And finally, I wanted to talk to you a little bit. Don't go out and tell anybody. Certainly nobody's, uh, no, no media is gonna record this because I haven't presented my strategic plan to the governor yet, but I'll tell you what the proposal will be. It hasn't yet been ratified, um, but um, the proposal for the next four years of the Department of Health uh, in our strategic plan has two primary components. These will shock no one, prevention and access, right? Okay, that's not hard to figure out. But under the prevention side of things, there are four primary components. Obviously, the things you would think about like tobacco use and obesity, but the other two, so there's four main components. The other two are substance misuse and ACEs. And everybody in here is familiar with ACEs. And, and as I referenced, I'm a child abuse pediatrician. And in that very small clinical practice, um, literally just a few hours per month, um, I still do evaluate children for suspected abuse and neglect. And um, usually that happens from, you know, three to five on a Friday afternoon. And I just saw patients, I don't know, four or five days ago, last Friday, whenever that was. And almost every single time, about 70% of what I do is, is outpatient sexual abuse. Um, and almost every single time I see a child, um, just like you guys were describing, four or five, six-year-old little girl, and I go home and I think, you know, I'm about to be 42 years old. And if that happened to me at my age and with my resources and with my education, I would look for the quickest way to find heroin or something else to forget that. I would wake up every single morning and want to forget that. And I'm not six years old. And so we really have to... that. I, I, know, I recognize that I'm a pediatrician and I might be biased towards childhood, but when we start to address adverse childhood experiences, all of these other ills that I've just described really start falling into place. And so that is a um, primary goal of the department over the next four years, uh, if the governor agrees. Um, I will tell you, as many of you know, it's a tough nut to crack. Uh, you know, what's the first thing you do when you do strategic planning, or one of the first things? You look at metrics. Ew, we're talking about generational. We're talking about how do we measure these things. So for the first year, we're just gonna train some people. We can count the number of people we train, and uh, as, our, as our methods get more sophisticated, so will our metrics. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to share that. I, I um, ask you to join me in supporting uh, all of the great work that you'll hear about today. And if nobody has told you thank you lately, you guys are making such an impact and I appreciate it. Thank you. decide if I'm going to stand up here because I'm 6'3 <laughs> and I'm got to, I may sit down. I'm going to
going to talk to you guys for a few minutes about 10 Care's approach to this crisis. And I'm going to loop in uh, these other two departments in this as well because it's not something we're doing on our own. And I certainly appreciate that. Um, so when we first started this journey a few years ago, um, I'll talk about the, one of the first aspects we did was look at primary prevention, which we consider to be how do we limit someone's duration of exposure when they're first given an opiate? So an acute or um, your just first exposure to it. So to do that, we came up with a, a limit in our pharmacy program. Uh, so our goal was to limit you to 15 days in a 180 day period. Now this is, again, uh, we try to be very careful. This is not applicable to acute or long-term users or uh, people on pain management. But our goal was to try to limit that first exposure. Two reasons for that. One, obviously you guys know the longer you're on an opiate, you're, you're at higher risk of um, being addicted to that. But as well, uh, it may limit the number of unused pills that are out there that are sitting in your medicine cabinet at home that your teenager or someone else can get a hold of. Um, the bottom slide, or bottom chart there, illustrates the impact of that. We uh, have shifted to 97% of our first time you, uh, opioid users are now receiving less than six days supply. Uh, we think that's a good thing. The, the top one there is an interesting one. Um, as you can see in the third and fourth quarters of 2015, we had paid for over 24 million pills. Uh, uh, over the, uh, that three-year period, we've cut that down to 12.2, 12.4 million. You'll see in that box where our, OP, our uh, limit started. You'll see that trajectory was going down before that, and that's where I want to say a couple of things about uh, these two other departments. I think there's some good news there around what the state is doing and what you're doing has an impact. We can't claim that we did that all by ourselves, obviously. What the MCOs did do is contract with some people who are experts in analyzing prescription data and working with prescribers on talking about how they may be an outlier. Is there a better approach to how you're um, working with people with pain? Uh, so we think that did help, but a lot of public service announcements and education from the state and the community has definitely made an impact, and that's, that's always good news. So, um, second thing was uh, trying to reduce the impact of opiates. Um, we talked about uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome a little bit. Uh, as you can see on this slide, hopefully in 2018, I don't know the numbers, but maybe it's plateaued or maybe it's decreased a little bit. We hope it is decreasing. Uh, in that vein, um, I'll, I'll drop to that bottom bullet on the left first. We worked, uh, and I really appreciate Department of Health working with us on getting us access to the CSMD database for our, our enrollees. What that has done is assisted our MCOs in identifying both avenues that someone could get prescription pain medication. And because some people pay cash, and we have limits on our adult side, so some people may, may be paying cash for some of their opiates. Uh, it helps them tailor their outreach to people who are in that uh, a dangerous situation. One of those situations is women of childbearing age. We're trying to get talk to them as much as we can about contraception and in encouraging the doctors who work with those patients to talk about contraception. So maybe we've helped uh, dim the tide a little bit on NAS. Uh, the, the bottom uh, box there, again, um, illustrates how we've reduce the total number of people on opiates, but really more significantly, the acute users, the, um, the chronic users, we are still working with them and being very thoughtful about how we approach that group. And I'll talk about that in a second. First, we had to get a treatment um, network together. Uh, about, about three years ago, we started talking with some providers who are coming in and saying, well, you're covering the Suboxone, but you don't pay enough for the, a good treatment program. And we heard that several times, and I finally, uh, Dr. Lloyd was at mental health then, 
I emailed him one day. I said, can you just give me a couple of programs to go talk to? I want to see what a good one looks like. So he, he sent me some names. And I went out to East Tennessee in the Mount Juliet, um, met several people. Some of them are in the audience today. Um, very passionate, uh, and uh, they love what they do. And they do a great job. I got yelled at a couple of times, um, but, I, but we needed it. We learned, I learned a lot. What I came back with to uh, TenCare was we've definitely got a problem out there. We had a, we had a, a substance abuse treatment network, but it was all abstinence-based. We weren't focusing on the MAT portion of things, which is a big hole, as you guys know these days. So we've spent, uh, we spent about a year developing what we would consider a good treatment model and what we would want our MCOs to pay for. And we worked with the Department of Mental Health on that and some providers out in the community. Uh, and now we have 104 plus MAT providers out there. Is that enough? Probably not. You know, if I were talking about um, challenges for the future, I think we still don't have enough uh, high quality prescribers out there. We need to work on that. Um, but we're, we're making progress. Uh, this is our long term goal. Uh, we're kind of in the middle of the first two in the, uh, the two in the middle there. And as we learn more about MAT, uh, we'd like to flip how we pay for uh, MAT programs into a more value-based outcome um, model, which we think would provide some more flexibility uh, in how, how people approach things. Um, so that's our long-term goal, and we're still working on developing a network. The next one for us, uh, Support Act requires all states to cover methadone which we do not cover methadone right now. We have it in 20 years. Uh, so we are, at, well, just like we did with uh, buprenorphine, we're educating ourselves on what methadone treatment looks like, what is a good methadone treatment program. So by October of next year, we will be uh, starting coverage of that. Uh, and we welcome any advice anyone has in the room on, on that subject. But um, we're definitely gonna be going there in the future. Um, I don't have a slide on obstacles. I would say I appreciate uh, what Matt said about housing. You know, as a Medicaid program, we can only pay for treatment. Um, so the other things that help someone through recovery that are not treatment-based, we're limited in that. So, so we depend a lot on Matt and his programs for that. Um, in the future, are there ways we could? Um, I don't know. We couldn't pay for it directly, but like I said, through value-based methods or outcomes-based performance bonuses, maybe there's some flexibility there where we can provide flexible ways for people to do some uh, non-traditional interventions. Um, the other, I talked a little bit about lack of prescribers. We're working with uh, Department of Health and Mental Health as well on, uh, we call it Project ECHO, the hub and spoke model of helping prescribers get comfortable with treating people with addiction and becoming what you've got your number. Why aren't you using your number? Let's help you get there. So that's one thing we're working on uh, as hard as we can. That's all I've got. So thank you very much uh, to the panel. We're running a bit late on time. If you, I, you, you probably noticed that I'm just going to put it out there. We're running a little bit late, but uh I want to, we have this panel here and, and um, we need to ask them a few questions. Five minutes of questions will be fantastic. Uh, while you're um, organizing your thoughts for a question, we'll say that the first ECHO um, session was yesterday and uh, Dr. Bill Brooks in the audience right over here is an epidemiologist with our center, uh, offered an ECHO about harm reduction. And, uh, and it, was, um, it was quite well received. Uh, smaller audience than we'd like because it's new and we're trying to roll it out, but um, it is, uh, we're, the, we're contracting with, uh, with the MCOs to provide that service uh, and, and train folks in the state. Um, so questions for the panel? Yes. Hi, Wayne Smith with Central Baptist Church in, uh, of Bearden here locally in Knoxville and a uh, question about 10 care. Um, uh, with uh, related to the substance abuse and misuse issues uh, is hepatitis C. 
And one of the things that I'm uh, wondering about is, as uh, TenCare moves forward, uh, is there any, any chance that we could uh, change the restrictions for Hep C treatment for those people who are in recovery, so that that doesn't continue to be a barrier? Uh, I know there are restrictions about uh, being clean and sober, and the housing model works, I think, here as well because if we if we get people close to those who care for them and in programs that are going to help them get better, uh, we're more likely to get them into recovery and make progress on those fronts. So to me, that's a continued barrier for, for treatment of hepatitis C, which is another epidemic we related to what we've been talking about today. So could you comment on that for me, please? Um, well, I would say my first answer would be we'll never say no to considering something. So um, if we're not where we need to be on that, and we probably aren't, uh, but we're trying to manage costs and other things as well. But we definitely are open to having that discussion, uh, especially if it is hindering um, outcomes that we all, all want to occur out there. We've got to figure out how that fits in our program and how the financing would work of that, of course. Money is always <laughs> an issue, but absolutely, we're open to having those discussions. Second question. So today's substance abuse disorder has been, dis has been called a disease, which it is. My mother had a disease and she ended up committing suicide whenever I was 15. She never actually received treatment. But if you actually look at Suboxone clinics in the East Tennessee area, you're paying anywhere from three to $500 out of pocket. At the end of the month, we pay $700 just so he can receive treatment. What does the state realistically believe they can help with this? Because you say that you want to help, but at the end of the day, you have so many people that go circle around. They come to the clinics, they get the treatment, they realize they can't afford to go back to the doctor. So you know what they do? They sell what they have left to try to go back. I work with people that literally have to sell half of their medicine just to receive treatment. This isn't just something that just happens to one or two people. I see it all the time. It is a money gambling problem. These doctors literally are going in and charging people. I mean, go, imagine going to the doctor once a month and they want to say, oh yeah, I can see you. They come in, script, 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 $700. What does the state plan on doing about this? Because it, it, that's an epidemic within itself. I mean, the disease is a huge issue but also the doctors are a huge issue. The money, you have to think, if you are a person that's suffering and you really are suffering from a disease, imagine being told that you have to pay $700 a month just to get help for your disease. Insurance doesn't cover it. The doctors don't want the insurance. They want your money, they'll tell you. They don't take insurance. It's cash payment, debit card, they might take a credit card. What does the state believe they can do about that? It's a very good question, and it's a significant um, it's a significant issue. Uh, Keith, do you want to talk about um, trying to get more people networked into taking uh, tin care, and and then perhaps uh, Matt, you want to speak to this as well? Either one. Yeah. So, yeah, I reference in, in my talk that we have been fortunate as a state, and I see our SAMHSA regional administrator in the back, Captain King. We've received $75 million in federal grants, but I will tell you, and on its face, you think, wow, that is a huge, huge amount of money. But you're right. When you look at the cost of the medications, it's, it's expensive. And here we're talking about addiction being a chronic disease. And I don't know about y'all, but I interpret a chronic disease as something that you deal with maybe the rest of your life. And, and I think the research is still out as far as how long someone needs to be on medication-assisted treatment. It's different for everybody. Um, it is expensive. Um, the other thing that, as you were talking, that I, that I was thinking about is, I don't know how many years ago, ago it was, but on the federal level, uh, the Mental Health Parity and Addiction Equity Act was, was passed. And we have been working with, with TenCare, uh, Commerce and Insurance, to ensure that there's equal access around behavioral health services as it compares to medical services, because I think it goes back to the cost. 
Um, the, the other thing I would say, and, and, and Dr. Piercy has been a part of this, as has TenCare, um, there is a health care transformation uh, group that's working right now out of the governor's office, and there's listening tours being conducted with people like y'all here in this room to get that type of feedback. Um, that's what we need to hear as a state. I think the meeting yesterday was on transparency. That goes back, I think, to the cost, and Dr. Piercy may want, may want to speak to that. But I'm right there with you. I, I know the cost can be prohibitive as it relates to our department and the uninsured indigent population that we serve. You know, we're covering that cost. But again, at some point, is it sustainable? Um, Naltrexon, buprenorphine, these costs can add up uh, when someone's in treatment for an extended period of time, which they very well may need to be. So I, I appreciate your question and I understand where you're coming from. Keith, do you want to add anything? Uh, just to say, you know, we're, we're trying to make sure that if someone on our program needs treatment, that they can avail themselves of the resources we have. Um, I think opening up the methadone uh, option will be a benefit to some of our members who are paying for that out of pocket now. Um, but, it, you know, the, I think one thing that young lady was addressing is there's a lot of uninsured people out yeah, there. Yeah, that's, I mean, that's the issue. And there's just a lack of resources. So um, Dr. Tim Smythe is, um, is an addiction medicine physician, medical director at Overmountain Recovery, and, uh, and has a evidence-based um, uh, uh, buprenorphine practice as well. And uh, he's right here with a comment. <laughs> Actually, I had a question, um, uh, the comment and question, and what the young lady was commenting on segues pretty good. Again, as Dr. Pack says, I'm Tim Smythe. I'm medical director of Overmountain Recovery, a uh, methadone clinic not-for-profit owned by uh, half by East Tennessee State University and Ballot Health. I'm also a uh, medical director of a busy OBOT clinic. We service about 1,200 patients. And yeah, we were about to close the doors in 2017 uh, because we started practicing evidence-based medicine. That is minimal effective dose, stay away from benzodiazepines, stay away from gabapentin, you know, uh, help to get people into long-term treatment for methamphetamine until the Virginia Arts Program came along and we signed up. And now we are only a 10 care and a Virginia Arts program provider. About 60% of our patients are Virginia Arts. You know, thank you, Co you know, Commissioner Piercy and Commissioner Yancey and uh, Director Gaither. You guys have been huge, and especially Commissioner Williams with her public partner partnership. Uh, we received $200,000 in grant funding from uh, Tennessee Department of Mental Health Substance Abuse Services. And, you know, one week after we got that funding, we were giving that money out and providing care. I was an evil cash clinic. You know, before January 1 of 2000, of 2019, this year, TenCare didn't pay for the services, right? Thank goodness you did it, and my hat's off to you. I mean, it's great. Uh, uh, we're actually making enough. It costs between $70 and $80 per patient per week to provide the services, and that's without the owners making any money at all. We have eight master's level counselors. It's always been part of it. We never made anyone pay extra. But, I mean, just to keep the doors open, the power company wants their money, the people at the front desk needs their money. So if you don't have third-party payers that are willing to pay for it, then you're going to go out of business if you practice evidence-based medicine. The only gripe that I have, again, and this goes to you know, Director Gaither, and I apologize for that, is the fact that we have to get a prior authorization for Suboxone, and at my clinic anyway, 100% are approved. So I'm spending money on that nurse to get the approval, and you're spending money for someone on your end, to approve it, and so I, I wish that could change. And you know, as a preferred provider for the Virginia Arts Program, we never had to get prior approvals, but the MCOs there are starting to require that too. You know, now again, a lot of people wanted prior approval from Virginia Medicaid to get the pills because they're they have a process addiction called snorting, and we don't get prior approvals for bioequivalent products. And the same thing for Ten Care, but maybe you can address that. But again, I, I thank you guys very much for all you've done because without you, we wouldn't. We wouldn't be in business providing evidence-based medicine. We'd be, you know, I hate to say it, but we'd be another, uh, we'd be out of business. Um, but now we can provide the services, so thank you. Any, any, uh, anyone want to respond? This will be the last comment. Um, we uh, need to get well, as far as prior auth goes, you know, I think there have definitely been discussions in the, in Ten Care of, as we get the MAT network um, established and know who the good guys are, 
uh, we'll probably have a preferred, that would be our preferred network. And at some point we'll be lifting prior auth for someone who has uh, a program that we feel is appropriate for our members. So I can't say when that's going to happen, but that is certainly on the, on, in the, on the list of things that we're considering in the future. And that'll be a good incentive, I think, for folks to get engaged with the um, buprenorphine prescribing network uh, that that uh, is being established there. Thank you so much for coming and uh, giving your um, your thoughts and your expertise, and thank you for the audience for your attention. Uh, you know, moving past this this time for lunch, I'm going to uh, go ahead and move off stage and let the uh, let the judge take over. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pack, and our panelists. Fantastic. Thank you.